thank you so much for inviting me to this and uh, so what i'll do is uh, i'll briefly talk about post colonial studies as i understand it and and how it is uh, significant here in united states but also for you in pakistan and then as always my hope is that you will ask me some good questions and that's what usually what carries the conversation uh, so basically post colonial studies in all its various forms um, gets established in american academy and in the british academy somewhere around the 1980s and it has varied strands people come to it from different places different points of view but by and large what it does is it deals with issues related to the 19th and 20th century colonialism and in that sense post colonial studies in a way is connected to the empires that were built post rise of capitalism right these are capitalistic empires and within that we primarily study the three continents right we study africa we study south asia i mean as a continent and then we study south america but then caribbean also forms a part of what we study and mostly what we deal with are the issues during the contact phase what happened how did the europeans conquer these territories how did they view the people of africa or asia or caribbean these are some of the issues that we try to study then another strain of course goes and studies what kind of resistances were mounted what happens to the colonized cultures how do the rights of minorities emerge how do the rights of women emerge and so all these facets of history historiography and literary production within that form part of what loosely we call post colonial studies that's why i'm always slightly per, per, perplexed when someone asks me to define it in two sentences because it's almost impossible to define it in two sentences inherently it's a deeply political field of study because it deals with issues of rights issues of equity issues of colonial plunder and then within the post colonies also we continue to explore the possibilities that exist the possibilities that need to be constructed uh, what role does politics play what role does global economy play in it you know what role does the local strata class based play in uh, the the trials and troubles of the post colonial nation states and then what is the role of nationalism what is the role of religion all of these things in one way or the other figure prominently in post colonial studies now a lot of people will give you a list of 10 scholars to read i mean there are pretty much a lot of people who we consider the leading figures of post colonial studies and of course edward said of course is one of the father figures gayatri spivak another homi baba another robert young uh, i would consider people like anil lumba and uh, um people like laila abu logad and uh, Chandra Mohanty also as these foundational figures of post colonial studies and then as a, as the sub, sub field gets established in the english departments of course we are a very voracious field we borrow and steal from any tradition that we can steal from we are not proud so you know we go and retrieve works by people like fenon clr james senor from the negritude movement from the african american rights movements from the abolitionist movement and of course from feminism 
And so conceptually and philosophically, then, it's a highly hybrid field. And then we also go and retrieve narratives and ways of thinking and philosophical modes of thinking from our own native cultures, right? I'm from Pakistan, so of course I go to Pakistani poetry, Pakistani fiction. I go to the Islamic thought, Islamic philosophy. So each one of us working in the metropolitan brings to the debate a certain body of knowledge that we learn in universities, which deals with colonization, post -colon the contact phase, the colonial phase, and the freedom struggles. And then we infuse it with the politics and cultural knowledge that we bring from our own cultures if we came from you know, one of the former colonies. And then when we teach, we allow our students to figure out, you know, what is it that they want to make into post-colonial studies? Uh, there is no set canon, even though I have a list on my website that doctoral students read. But most of the times, we don't worry about what needs to be included as long as the students conceptually have a broader knowledge of the field and broad, broader knowledge of debates. But as a field of study, the absolute worst that you can do it to it is to reduce it to a few tropes, right? A few fixed ideas. So the promise of post-colonial studies is that it is by its very nature a transgressive field of study, right? It, it it chips away at the established canon of English literature. It, it, it problematizes the established canon of American literature or feminism or any other conceptual fields of literary studies because it brings the point of view of what we would consider formerly colonized people and currently people who live in developing world and still you know, are under the mandates of powers that be. And it, and it does that. That's why it's a transgressive field of study. But there is a danger in just, you know, reading a couple of books and forming your opinions about post-colonial studies because it can also be reduced to a certain kind of nativist reactionaryism, right? And by that, what I mean is that people just basically say, oh, we 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 have great literature. We'll just read that and that's it, and we hate this, and we hate that. And that, that kind of uh, problematic, I mean, Fanon talks about that in at the end of the black skin, white masks, right? The politics of victimhood, he calls it, uh, and he's against that. And, I, and it, that doesn't serve any purpose. So that's the danger, is, is as to what you make it. And if you keep it fluid and open as a field of study that is willing to learn and steal from anywhere in the world to shape its arguments, to have its debates, then it remains that transgressive, powerful field of study. If you reduce it to a national mode of thinking or a religious mode of thinking or a simply one cultural way of thinking, then you would have defanged post-colonial studies and made it into something that loses its revolutionary potential. Because the power of post-colonial studies isn't that it's brilliant or original. Its power is that it doesn't believe in simplistic certitudes, right? It does not believe in simplistic binaristic truths, right? And so it, it puts, what do you call it, the cultural sign under erasure, right? And it basically recommends that we, we take what we need from wherever it is available and shape our own discourses, right? And that we don't worry about being hybrid and being mixed, right? And so we take something from Hegel, something from Kant, and then we go and visit Al-Farabi and Al-Kindi, right? and somehow put them in a conversation. While we are talking about the analytical philosophers and continental philosophers, we can also bring in, you know, what did the Mutadilla think? Who were the Asharites, Al-Ashariya, right? And then that 
brings the European knowledge itself, its structures to crisis because it doesn't account for those knowledges most of the times. And a great example of it is uh, Said's discussion in, um, in his book, The Word, The Critic, and The Text. There is a moment there where he brings in a debate, you know, a 10th century debate from Al-Undalus, right? From the group of grammarians who were there. And their discussion of what they call the Zahiriya and Batiniya way of looking at things, which eventually becomes two huge political movements in the Abbasid Empire. And by discussing them, you know, Zahiriya scholars were the ones who believed that there is, we shouldn't be seeking the hidden meanings of the Quran. We should just read the text and contextualize it in the present and in the past, and that will give us the meaning of the text. And the Bataniya scholars believed that there are always hidden meanings in a text, and we will only reach the meaning of meaning if we have dug deep enough linguistically into the root verbs of Arabic and then found, find the truth. And so the Zahiriya scholars said, no, no, if that's what God wanted, he would have not said that I've made everything easily accessible to you. So these were the major debates, but Said brings it in as a philosophical tool because he is discussing the role of the texts in the world. What do they do? And he's arguing that the texts are worldly, right? But he doesn't go to Hegel or Kant, right? He goes to 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 Spain, to the Muslim Spain. And that is an act of intervention and introduction within the Western debates of an idea that had existed for thousands of years but had never been acknowledged. That is the revolutionary potential of post-colonial studies as a field within the English departments but also beyond. And so if you can do that, while living in Pakistan, you know, here is the choice that you have to make. You're all, most of you are in school, getting your degrees. You know, ask yourself, first of all, why am I getting this degree, right? Because that would tell you how you will craft your future. If it's just to, you know, get an MPhil and then get a PhD and then get a job, then that's fine. Those are very pragmatic priorities, right? And you should follow those. There is nothing wrong with being pragmatic, right? But if your idea is to contribute into the global debates, to, to, to become a voice, right, to have a place to speak from, then your mission is twofold. One, learn the narratives of your former masters. Now see what they are about. You know, see how deep they are, how much do they know. Go read their Shakespeare, read their Ben Jonson, right? Read their philosophers, old and new, right? Form an opinion about that. After you have done that, after you have under your belt, then you've mastered all they've got, right? What can they throw at you? Marx, right? Robert Nozick, right? Richard Rotary, all the analytical philosophers, Hegel, Kant, Nietzsche, you've already read them. And then when you bring your great philosophers, your great minds into the debate, right? Then they have no clue about it. So what do you do then? What you're insisting is not that I should be included, but rather you're saying, I have read your texts. I understand them. I can talk about them. I can publish about them. But here is my challenge to you. Right? Go read Al-Farabi. See how does he mobilize the syllogism. How does it work? Right? Or Al-Kindi. Right? You know, what were the major debates of medieval Islam? Right? Why were they major debates? Then you are throwing down the gauntlet and your culture 
its history, its philosophies, its knowledges, or the tool with which you dismantle this edifice of Western Academy and pose a challenge, right? That is what Saeed did. That is what Gayatri Spivak does. That is what Homi Baba does, unsettles the certainties of Western philosophy, of Western historiography or cultural studies. So if that is what you want to do, right? I hope so you do, right? Then your path is different. Then you're not worried about finishing 12 courses and getting a job. Then you you are a learner, right? Your, your emphasis is scholastic. And that takes work. That takes courage. And that's where post-colonial studies, of course, can help you because it enables you to learn what the so-called West has produced and, but it also enables you to mobilize your own cultural knowledge, right? Your own cultural histories, philosophies, without being a nativist, right? Without insisting that our way is right and your way is wrong. There are no right and wrong ways. Our idea of right and wrong, there are a few universals, right? We believe in that. But beyond that, what we consider good or bad and everything else is socially produced. It's culturally produced. Um, and knowing that is important because then what you, what you get to know is that there is nothing natural, right? Um, most social ideas and belief systems are not natural. They are socially produced. And by that, what I mean is that we, we, we are born into an ideology. Our parents initiate us into it. We believe in it. We, we, then it becomes the logical system within which we work. Then it becomes the measuring tape with which we measure the world, right? But the reason we believe in any given idea or any given belief system is because we were socialized into it. The, the beauty of any kind of work, especially thought, is to go beyond it, to compare it with others, and to compare it openly, right? Not with a protective mindset. And then borrow whatever good you see elsewhere. Infuse it into your own culture. Make it rich or richer, right? You can't fall back to whatever you believe is the truth and think that that is going to save the world or save you because... You know, the path to changing the world is not in the past. The past can teach us about the mistakes that we have made. It cannot teach us what the future is. The present also cannot teach us what the future is. We cannot imagine the future in the vocabularies of the future because they are not accessible to us. But maybe we can bend the present somewhat to think the future, but we certainly cannot imagine the future with the narratives of the past because they are twice removed from the future. So post-colonial studies, if you really want to do it, is not reductive, doesn't have one single or two definitions, and you can make it into what you want as long as you're challenging power as long as you're challenging social and political hierarchies, as long as you're speaking in solidarity with people who are silenced, ill-treated, right? Or, or uh, you know, oppressed. These are the preconditions. You cannot speak for power and be a post-colonialist. That is against the basic grain of the discipline. So you have to commit yourself to whatever constituency is fighting an oppressive force, to whatever constituency is fighting a system that reduces them to passive right holders, right? If you go by a Gambon. And that's the mission, right? Beyond that, you can be a post-colonial eco-feminist, you can be a post-colonial, uh, you know, Marxist, you can be a post-colonial structuralist, post-structuralist. The, the field is open as long as you are committed to the people and as long as you advocate for their rights and fight for their rights. Anyone, anywhere in the world 
if they are under a state of oppression or if they are being silenced or erased are your people as a post-colonialist. Who will never be your people is the people in power, right? You can't write for the, you know, what is it, a bank or a big business. You can't be on their payroll and be a post-colonialist. I mean, even the universities are problematic because they are kind of corporations. But but that's my brief message about post-colonial studies, that it is, do not reduce it to a few tropes. It is one of the most promising field of studies because it allows you to play with the text philosophies and histories of the West and then bring your own narratives, your own stories and put them in a conversation. It allows you to write political scholarship and fight for the rights of people wherever they are. It allows you a certain kind of activist public scholarship, right? And it allows you to question power. How did it exist during the colonial times? What kind of power structures emerged after the colon colonization ended? What are our struggles right now? How many of them are of our own making? How many of them are caused by the economic order in which we exist? How many of them are caused by the power structures of the world? All of these things can be covered under post-colonial studies with one cautionary note, and that is without being a nativist, without saying, oh, I am from here, and that's my truth, and that's the best truth, right? Because that then reduces your argument to a grounded position in their own positionality and takes away from you this, this element of conceptual philosophical flight, right? Where, where you let your thought roam and, and see where it lands you, right? And you will always land at the right place because you have anchored yourself with the people, right? The people you want to serve, the people with whom you want to work, the people from whom you will learn. And that is your anchor. So that's all I have to say. I know it's not a very useful conversation because most of the times people expect a structured, you know, point by point message on any given field of study, uh, but I'll be very happy to answer any questions that you might have.